Hello. Hello, hello. Welcome. Hello. This is the Cloud English Podcast. My name is Luke, and it is great to have you here. Today is April 7th, 2044, and we're going to be talking about today vocabulary. We're going to be talking about the eclipse that's happening tomorrow a little bit. And so I think it's going to be pretty interesting. We're also going to be looking at a couple of interesting little games that you can use to practice specific types of vocabulary using a Mad Lib, right? That's going to be interesting. And so I think we have a lot of things, uh, a lot of things to, to look at. So let's get into it. Uh, I want to start with, so tomorrow is a total solar eclipse. I want to start with that. We're going to look at an article because I wasn't originally going to see it, but now I'm planning to actually go into the path of the eclipse to see it, and I'm very excited. It's a bit of a drive, but um, I'm looking forward to it. And I wonder if anyone else in the path of the eclipse is watching or planning to go watch the eclipse happen. Or if you're watching this after it has happened and you were there and you witnessed it, I would be very curious to hear your impressions. I obviously don't know what my impressions will be because I haven't seen a total solar eclipse before. When I was a kid, I seem to remember seeing a partial eclipse. We would look at the eclipse in coffee. You make coffee and then you look into the coffee and you can see a reflection because you don't want to stare directly into it as the sun is being occluded by the moon. I also have some glasses this time, but as a kid, I remember, I remember it not being the full thing, so it didn't get dark. But apparently tomorrow it's going to get dark. But if you're not in the path of the eclipse, then it will not get dark. So you have to actually be in a specific band of land. And millions of people are traveling from all over the country and all over the world to be in the path so that they can witness this once-in-a-lifetime thing. Pretty exciting. So I want to I first go into an article. We'll look at some language for that uh, and uh, learn about it a little bit. And then we'll get into some other vocabulary stuff. Let's see, what else? Yeah, before we do that, if you haven't already done so, I would appreciate it if you could hit the like button and subscribe. That's a great, fantastic way to support the show. This is also my third episode of the podcast from home, and I want to get your opinion about it in terms of well, the way that I plan the content is the same, but it's different. It looks different. It may sound slightly different. Not that I will be here permanently. I don't plan to be, but for now, um, let me know what you think. Feed blunt, brutally blunt and honest feedback is more than welcome. And it's for some reason, my eyes keep being drawn to there rather than there. If you're listening, you won't see this, but there's a a screw holding the camera in place, the actual camera lens is there and the screw is there. So I apologize if I sometimes look at the wrong thing. I'm sorry, I'm at, in my, my home setup here in my, my wife's um, office, home office. Okay, so yes, like and subscribe, grab the free course if you haven't already done that. Check out the monthly membership at 30% off, which is, I think, a fantastic deal if you haven't checked that out. You can get 30% off for 12 months. So that's the yearly membership price, price paid monthly. Yeah, price paid monthly. Um, let me see... I think that's about it. Discord, of course, you can join the Discord if you like. I'm also working on a tool that will allow people to get feedback on their English anytime that they like using 
GPT-4. So that's exciting. All right, let's get into the article. What we're going to do is we're going to learn vocabulary from an article about the eclipse. The solar eclipse is happening tomorrow. And I think we could learn some words and phrases connected to it. We're going to look at a specific article talking about it, introducing some of that language. And we will also keep a word bank. So we'll be over here in our word bank. And for now, I think we can hop into our article as well. So the article, let's jump right into it. Your last minute guide, your last minute guide to Monday's total solar eclipse. Here's where and when to see the rare celestial event, how to view it safely, and a few fun milestones to look out for if you're lucky enough to be in the path of totality. So just in the title and the subtitle, I think we have some really interesting language that we can look at. So we have total solar eclipse, celestial event, and path of totality. Okay, so total total, I'm just going to write these down. Total solar eclipse celestial event path of totality And you know what? I think you probably know the word milestone, but let's just put that down anyway. Milestone. Okay. So, we'll look at these in context. And it, this, again, this is right at the beginning of the article here. But pay attention to the adjective here because there isn't just one type of eclipse. You have this word here, and then eclipse. To eclipse is to pass someone. It's sort of like pass, or overcome, or overtake, pass, in this case, pass in front of, to completely cover. One might say that a pupil will eventually eclipse his or her teacher or master or sensei, right? To eclipse your teacher or master or sensei would be to learn everything they know and then surpass them, potentially even replacing them as the new sensei or master. But we could have other adjectives here, and we'll see this, but we'll see the word lunar as well. So what you'll notice then is that both the sun and the moon have adjectives and sun and moon are not really close to the adjectives that we use to talk about the sun and moon. We say sol, er, solar, as the adjective for the sun. Sol means sun. And lunar, lunar, to mean moon. It's the adjective of the moon. So a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse. Last year I saw a lunar eclipse where the moon turns red. Pretty interesting. A lunar voyage would be a voyage to the moon. Celestial simply relates to things that happen up in the night sky. Sometimes this is used to associate with things like heaven, right? But it is up in the stars because often heaven is associated with the stars as well. You'll hear phrases like the celestial veil, right? Or a celestial plan. This would be 
stuff that's up there, but it might come from God, or we might just be talking about the stars themselves. We may be talking about astrology, right? It could be any of the above, stuff up there, and associations to stuff up there, which could be, again, in a religious system, all celestial, all celestial. So is this a celestial event? Yes, it's a thing happening up there, right? The sun is going to be blocked by the moon. So it is a celestial event. The path of totality, okay? Well, what is the opposite of total? The opposite of total is the word partial. Now, partial is an adjective. Partial is an adjective. Total is an adjective. Totality is a noun. Partiality is also a noun. Partial means not completely. Total means completely. So if you are in the path of totality, you're in the path where you will get to see the moon totally eclipse the sun, blocking it out not allowing it to shine as it normally would, except you do see the, the outside of it, the corona, but you, you don't see the disk of the sun. Okay, so that's a total eclipse. Partial eclipse is where you see the moon partially block the sun. I think that's the one I saw when I was, when I was a kid. Okay, and then milestone is uh, an important point. Uh, reaching something in your life, a big milestone, a career milestone, things like that. Okay. I don't even know if we need to write that one down. But let's let's go back to our article here. If that's okay. We didn't actually start it. We're going to read through it pretty quickly and just pick out any interesting words specifically related to the eclipse, not every new piece of piece of language that we that we come across. Okay, let me actually zoom in slightly. There we go. A total solar e eclipse will cross North America on Monday, offering millions a rare opportunity to see afternoon skies temporarily darken as the moon blocks the face of the sun. Temporarily darken as the moon blocks the face of the sun. Sometimes we say face if it's like the moon. It's not often face for sun. It's often the, the surface or the disk of the sun, because it's so bright. I, I don't hear face used that, that often. The, eclipse, the eclipse's path fortuitously cuts across Mexico, 15 U.S. states, and a small part of eastern Canada. In all other states in the continental U.S., viewers will be treated to a partial, we talked about that, partial solar eclipse, with the moon appearing to take a bite out of the sun and obscuring part of its light. So that's what I remember seeing as a child. I saw a, I believe, partial solar eclipse. I saw in the little, the little coffee dish, I saw a dark half circle covering the sun. It was very, very interesting. So let's, let's look at the word partial here and continental U.S., just in case not everyone is clear about that. So, oops, one second. Obscuring, oops, wrong color. Let me change colors here. Obscuring. Whoops, wrong tool. <laughs> there we go. Obscuring. And you'll see the word obscure sometimes to cover something. And continental. U.S. Okay, so if something obscures something, it covers it in a way, 
or possibly makes it less clear or less easy to see. To obscure the truth would be to hide it or make it difficult to see the truth. To obscure my view would be to kind of get in the way or make it harder for me to see something. Well, if the sun is not being totally blocked, then what is it? What is happening? Uh, it's being obscured by the moon. We're not being able to see it 100%. Something that is obscure, this word here, this word, obscure, is the same basic idea, but sometimes it's used to mean rare because it's hard to see or hard to find. This is a very obscure album, for example. And continental United States generally refers to the 48 contiguous United States, but also sometimes can include Alaska. But some people think of that as the 48 states that don't include Alaska and Hawaii. Okay. All right, back to the article here. Here's everything you need to know about the rare celestial event. What is a solar eclipse? Solar eclipses occur when the sun, moon, and earth align. The moon passes between earth and the sun, temporarily blocking the sun's light and casting a shadow on earth. A total solar eclipse is when the moon fully obscures, we know that word now, uh, obscures the sun, whereas a partial solar eclipse means it blocks just a portion of the sun's face. So that's all the language. We, we already know that. We already learned all of the language, and that makes it a lot easier. Pretty cool. Solar eclipses occur only with the new moon because the moon's orbit around the earth is tilted. The three bodies, uh, because the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted, the three bodies don't always line up in a way that creates an eclipse. And in fact, I mean, maybe we'll read this, but in fact, I believe that solar eclipses are quite rare, and I read that one won't happen again across the United States for many years. I believe 20, I think it's 2044 when the next one is going to happen. So it's a very rare event. That's why I'm going to see it. Imagine if the moon's orbit were in a plane of Earth's orbit around the sun. If that were the case, then every new moon you'd have a total solar eclipse and every full moon you'd have a lunar eclipse. Neil deGrasse Tyson, director of the Hayden Planetarium, at the American Museum of Mat Natural History told NBC News. So because things don't always align, it lends to the rarity of the event and the uh, rarity of the event and the specialness of the event. Indeed, rare and special. So um, the idea is that it's the, the alignment is less rare because of the plane of the moon. The moon's orbit were in the plane of the earth around the sun. P-L-A-N-E, plane. So you'll see this word sometimes, P-L-A-N-E, P-L-A-N-E. Sometimes you'll see it in reference to mathematics. We talk about you talk about planes. Um, sometimes you see it in reference to things being lined up. In this case, in the same plane means that the moon is going around this way and the earth is going this way and the sun is in the same, the same line this way, but actually the moon is more like this and so it's not totally lined up in the same way as the Earth's orbit around the sun. And because of that, because they're not in the same plane, it's more rare for it to cross the same line and totally line up. I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty cool. All right. Let's keep going. We're learning here. Where and when will the eclipse be visible? 
This year's eclipse will follow a slightly wider path over more populated areas of the continental U.S. than other total solar eclipses have in the recent past. NASA estimates that 31.6 million people live within what's known as the path of totality. Again, we learned that where the total solar eclipse will be visible. An additional 150 million people live within 200 miles of the path, according to the agency. Yes, yeah, so my understanding is that there will be a fairly large influx of people to areas, cities, towns within the path of totality. I'm one of them, I suppose. I'm planning to be in the path of totality because I want to, I want to see it. I want to witness it. Um, but there's going to be a huge influx of people into the path of totality from nearby cities, nearby towns, uh, because, you know, for example, New York City is not that far. It's a few hours from the path of totality. A lot of people from big cities like that, from the East Coast, because it's relatively close to the East Coast, where there are a lot of people, people will want to, uh, you know, take a, take a day trip to be in the path of totality. So the path of the solar eclipse on April 8th, the moon will block out the sun in parts of the Midwest and Northeast. And there is the path of totality. And here are the times. Dallas at 1.42 p.m. Central Time. Little Rock, Buffalo, New York, 3.20 Eastern Time. So we can see that actually within a fairly short span of time, the uh, path of totality, the eclipse will go through the path of totality. Pretty cool. And then, oh, I see. This is interesting. So what they're showing here is the, the first line is you get 90% occlusion, 80%, 70%. So I think even if I didn't go into the path of totality, I would be able to see, and I think this is, yeah, also in New York City looks like right on the line between 90 and 80 that you would be able to see 90%, a 90% partial eclipse, which is probably still pretty, pretty impressive. Okay, the path travels through Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Tiny parts of Michigan and Tennessee will also be able to witness totality if conditions are clear. After the eclipse crosses into Canada, it will pass over southern Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Cape Breton at the eastern end of Nova Scotia. Okay, I think nothing there for us to for us to learn. Those outside the path of totality can still take part in the astronomical event by viewing a partial solar eclipse visible throughout all 48 states of the contiguous U.S. And I, I, as I understand it, contiguous U.S. and continental U.S. I think are the same thing, I think. But maybe the continental U.S. also includes Alaska, but not Hawaii. You know what? Don't quote me on that. I'm not totally sure. Because they've used both continental U.S. and contiguous. Contiguous, I know, is doesn't include Alaska and Hawaii. But continental, is it the same? Is it 48 or is it 49 states? I'll have to look, look that up later. Okay, anyway. Uh, I want to I want to write down astronomical because that one is very important. That's an important word to be at least aware of. Okay, let me change let me change colors. Astronomical. If something is astronomical, it relates to Astronomy, it relates to the stars. Astronomy is the study of the stars and, and often the physics that maybe allows you to understand how things move and how gravitation works, right? Uh, radio astronomy would be looking through telescopes or looking through, l looking at stars with large radio telescopes. Um, 
all of this is, if you see the word astro, astronaut, right, astrology, all of these relate to stars. And generally, we would consider that to be bodies up there in the night sky, because that could include generally planets as well as meteors, asteroids, planetoids, uh, brown dwarfs, all kinds of things, nebula, other galaxies, right? It's, it's all regarded as kind of the same stuff within, within the concept of astronomy or in, within the concept when we're talking about um, astronomical observations, for example, we could be talking about any of those things. Now, astro, that root word, could be related to other things. For example, astrology is the study of trying to, it's divination, kind of trying to understand a person's life and their path or fate using the stars or rather lights in the sky as a kind of map, but it's still looking up at stars, but you'll have that same root word. And an astronaut uh, also is not is another another root word that um, is where we're going to be talking about in a different video. Um, but it connects to astro meaning again, out there among the stars. Okay, so anytime you see that astro next to it, just kind of associate outer space, the stars, galaxies, planets, all that stuff. Okay. The timing, including how long totality lasts, depends on the location, but some spots will see the full uh, the moon fully covered, fully cover the sun for up to four minutes and 28 seconds. Pretty cool. Below is a list of timings for some cities along the path of totality as provided by NASA. A number of other resources, including blah, 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 dot com can also, uh, can also help people plan. Okay, so here, this is just a list of cities. We're going to skip that. And that is what a total solar eclipse looks like. That area around is called, I believe, the corona. And these pictures above would be partial, partial eclipses. I remember when I was a kid seeing something like this one on the bottom where the sun kind of became a crescent. And you looked at it through, through coffee the reflection of the sun in dark coffee. How to safely view a total solar eclipse. It is never safe to gaze directly at the sun, even when it is partially or mostly covered by the moon. Special eclipse glasses or pinhole projectors are required to safely view solar eclipses and prevent eye damage. Failing to take proper precautions can result in severe eye injury, according to NASA. Wow. That's pretty scary. Severe eye injury. Eclipse glasses are thousands of times darker than normal sunglasses and, is, and specially made to enable wearers to look at the sun during these kinds of celestial events. I have a pair of eclipse glasses right over there, which hopefully will work. I, w I was reading some scary articles about how some, you have to be careful, some eclipse glasses are fake, and, and you put them on, and then the sun burns your eyes. Some are real, so you have to be very careful and make sure that the eclipse glasses are approved, uh, real eclipse glasses. Sky watchers should also never view any part of the sun through binoculars, telescopes, or camera lenses unless they have spe uh, specific solar filters attached. Eclipse glasses should not be used with these devices as they will not provide adequate protection. One thing I'm disappointed about is I didn't get a filter in time for my telescope. So I have a telescope. I will only be able to take a um, I will only be able to take a video of the total solar eclipse when it's dark, and I won't be able to take a video of the before and the after with my telescope because I don't have the correct filter because I didn't order it in time. But you can buy solar eclipse filters for your telescopes. During the few minutes of totality when the moon is fully blocking the sun, 
it is safe to look at the naked eye. So once the full eclipse actually happens, then you take off your eclipse glasses. Beware of fake, oh, here they go. Beware of fake eclipse glasses. Only legitimate pairs, uh, on legitimate pairs, legitimate pairs means real ones, the lenses should have a silver appearance on the front and be black on the inside. The manufacturer's name and address should be clearly labeled and they should not be torn or punctured. Check as well for the ISO logo and blah, blah, blah. If you don't have eclipse glasses, you can make a homemade pinhole projector, which lets sunlight in through a small hole, focuses it and projects it onto a piece of paper, wall or other surface to create an image of the sun that is safe to look at. Yeah, I have, I think we did that as a kid too. So we had the coffee and we looked at the, the eclipse in the coffee. And also I think we made a pinhole camera if I'm not mistaken. Okay, we're gonna skip the instructions there. For that, what to look for while viewing the total solar eclipse. For people along the path of totality, there are some fun milestones to keep track of as the total solar eclipse unfolds. If you see this word unfold, the word unfold can it's it's a pretty interesting one because it can it can mean a lot of a lot of different things. I'll write this up here to un, uh, we keep choosing the wrong color, to unfold. And you might think, hold on a second, how can an eclipse unfold? Well, a lot of things can unfold. A plan can unfold, a strategy can unfold, maybe a, a series of emotions can unfold as you react to something, right? Uh, maybe, you can, you can unfold a blanket, right? You can, you can unfold all kinds of things. There's a maybe projection that has been made about the future. And based on how accurate it is, you would say things are unfolding according to my projection. Well, this is kind of like opening up, right? Like a piece of origami, you unfold it to maybe study how it's how it's folded so that you can learn how to make that particular piece of origami, right? So it's pretty broad, right? And so you can talk about an eclipse as unfolding. It's usually a process or a thing that can happen or develop over time. Pretty interesting, I think. Okay, so that's, that's unfold. As the eclipse progresses and the sun gets thinner in the sky, it will start to get eerily dark, according to Tyson. That's Neil deGrasse Tyson. The diamond ring effect is shown following totality of the solar eclipse at Palm Cove in Australia's tropical North Queensland in 2012. It's called the diamond ring effect. That's pretty cool. I can, I mean, I don't think we need to explain that further other than just looking at the picture. Diamond, oh, am I the right color? Yeah. No, I always, I always have blue. I always forget to change colors. Diamond ring, the diamond ring effect for obvious reasons, because it looks like a diamond ring. It's pretty cool. When the last beams of sunlight are about to become obscured, look out for the diamond ring effect. The sun's atmosphere will appear as an illuminated halo, and the last light still visible will look like the diamond of a giant ring. As the sunlight de decreases even further, an effect known as Bailey's beads will be created by the moon's rugged terrain. Tiny beads of light will be visible for only a few seconds around the dark moon as the last bits of sunlight peer through the moons, mountains, and valleys. When the moon is fully blocking the sun, it is safe to remove eclipse glasses and look at the total solar eclipse with the naked eye. Very interesting, Bailey's beads. I think that's the last one we'll write down here. Look that up. Bailey's, oops, let me. Let's see, where can I write this? Can I write this down here? 
Bailey's beads. That works. Not a lot of space. I wonder who that's named after. It does look like beads. I have, so I have a telescope and I, when I look through my telescope at the moon, on, under certain conditions, if it's very clear, you can see on the edge of the moon mountains and it's actually quite jagged. That's how either big the mountains are or that's how far you can, you can zoom in, but they're pretty pronounced. And so when the sun is shining through them, the edge of the moon, the disk of the moon as the sun is shining through, it's not even. The sunlight is not even because the moon is not a bowling ball. It's rough. And so it might be shining through some places and blocked in others. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. All right, let's finish this one up. Ah, Bailey's beads. There they are. Pretty cool. Is that it? Um, is that it? Some lucky sky watchers may even catch a glimpse of a comet. Comet 12P Ponds Brooks, nicknamed Devil Comet, because uh, an eruption last year left it with two distinct tails of gas and ice in the shape of devil horns, is currently visible from the northern hemisphere as it swing, swings swing through the inner solar system. The comet can be seen in the early evenings by gazing toward the west-northwest horizon. During the eclipse, when skies darken during totality, it may be possible to see the comet near Jupiter, but its visibility will depend on whether it's in the middle of an outburst and thus brighter than normal. Nice. Okay. Let's try to get through this last section here. When is the next solar eclipse? The next total solar eclipse will be in 2026, but it will most likely pass over the Arctic Ocean, with some visibility in Greenland, Iceland, Portugal, and northern Spain. In 2027, a total solar eclipse will be visible in Spain and a swath of North Africa. The next total solar eclipse visible from North America will be in 20, 2033, but only over Alaska. Then in 2044, so 20 years from now, a total solar eclipse will cross Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and parts of Canada and Greenland. So this is a truly, truly special event. The next total solar eclipse to cross the continental U.S. coast to coast will occur in 2045. The path of totality for that eclipse will cut through California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. So that's number one, farther away from me, but it seems like we're, this is such a rare event that you, you know, if you're, if you have an opportunity to go see it, you have to do it. You have to do it, right? You've got to do it. You have no choice. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's just quickly recap the words we've talked about here so that we, so that we have them in mind. The key, the key words for this article. So unfold is when something happens over a period of time, often from a simpler thing to a more complex thing or towards some goal, perhaps. It's very broad and can be used in a lot of different ways. Lunar is the adjective that we use for the moon. Solar is the adjective we use for the sun. We learned the diamond ring uh, effect, I believe was the effect, right? Um, which is about the appearance of the sun as the eclipse is happening. It looks like a diamond ring around the moon's surface. Uh, we looked at other ways to use eclipse besides just this type of eclipse, right? Uh, a student may eclipse his or her teacher or master. Celestial event, something up in the heavens, right? Uh, used in a lot of different ways, including to, in many religions, use the word celestial path of totality specifically for an eclipse. This is the path where we can see the full eclipse. We talked about milestones, a point along a progression obscure or obscuring. To obscure something is to block it or hide it or make it more difficult to see. Partial, not complete. 
the adjective partial partiality would be the noun, totality is the noun, total would often be the adjective form. Continental, the continent relating to a continent would be, for example, the United States and Canada are generally considered North America, that would be a continent, and South America would be another continent. Again, is continental United States the same as contiguous United States? That is something that I will have to look up and figure out another day because I can't remember. Plane, P-L-A-N-E, is a, a kind of surface or things being in line with each other. If things are in a specific line or lined up in a certain way, they are on often on a plane. And we often talk about planing a surface or making it flat or straight. In fact, the machine that makes wood straight on the surface is called a, a planer because it makes it go on a plane. And often a plane is used for, uh, for mathematics as well. Uh, let's see, Astro uh, astronomical. Again, look out for that root. Astro relating to the heavens or the stars or bodies in the night sky. And the study of that would be astronomy. And if it's related to uh, divination, then it would be astrology. But that root astro is the same. And we learned Bailey's beads. Thank goodness we learned about Bailey's beads when the sun is shining through the mountains hills and valleys of the lunar surface. So that is it for the article. Hope at least you learned some words. If you have any questions, let me know. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and also get a free course in the links in the description. Alrighty. Alrighty. Let's move right along, shall we? Shall we? I'm going to I'm going to delete this. Since I'm in my home setup, I'm still getting used to using the, the board in this way. I've kind of got everything. Everything's kind of compressed on my screen, and I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of getting used to the layout of everything. And so, you know, bear with me, all right? Bear with me. Let us bear. Let us bear bear with each other. Shall we? Okay. Um, let's keep moving here. I have some other stuff that I want to get to. Just as a reminder uh, for those listening, if you want to watch, you can certainly do that on Facebook and YouTube. YouTube is the main channel for viewing. If you're watching and sometimes you'd like to listen, you can find that in the links in the description but you can just search Cloud English Podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Amazon, too, actually. Uh, let's see. Overcast, any of those. But I would appreciate if you are listening, if you could, for example, if you're on Apple Podcasts, go to the place to rate the podcast and give it five stars. And same deal if you're on Spotify hit the uh, rating option and give it five stars. That really helps out. And a like and subscribe on YouTube. And I don't really care what you do on Facebook, to be honest. <laughs> when it comes to Facebook, it is what it is, is what I say. I don't really understand Facebook. It's hard for me to figure out the tools. Facebook has so many tools, but they're all a jumble. And it, uh, yeah, I don't know. I have thoughts about Facebook. Let's just say that, shall we? Oh, well, we spent way too long looking at that article. Um, apologies if you found it boring, but I, I learned some things. I learned about Bailey's beads, the diamond ring effect. That's pretty cool. It's cool stuff. I like that. All right. All right. Let's get on to the next thing, shall we? What is next? Hold on. Let me see what's next. Oh yeah, we were going to talk about we were going to talk about root words. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about root 
words. <laughs> One thing that you can do to learn words more quickly, or at least get an idea for words more quickly, is to understand roots. Not, not roots that grow underground. No, no, that's not what I mean. I mean word roots. There are these pieces of words that can be used in a lot of words. And you may, you may have noticed that sometimes one piece of one word is the same as another piece in another word. It's the same piece. What is going on, right? So an example would be the word cardio. So cardio is a root word which relates to the heart or the system connected to the heart. And so when you hear words like doing cardio, right, I'm going to go do, what are you doing? Cardio or cardiovascular to talk about the system relating to the heart or cardiologist. When you hear these words, you, you realize if you know the word cardio relates to the heart that, oh, if I hadn't known one of those, I could have guessed. I might have been able to guess what that meant. If someone says, for example, I'm a cardiologist, and I didn't know the word cardiologist, but I did know that cardio relates to the heart, then I might have guessed that a cardiologist is a kind of doctor of the heart, or, or for example, a cardiothoracic surgeon, or something like that. Okay, this is related to the heart. And so studying roots, studying parts of words more broadly, can be a great way to guess words. It can actually be very cool because you can, you can kind of say, I think I can guess what that word means even though I've never seen it before. Now, this is also true for prefixes and suffixes. A prefix would be like D, D-E, for example, right, or by. And a suffix would be like an ending, T-I-O-N or L-Y, these word endings. And, and learning these pieces can be very useful because then, again, you can guess what people mean even when you don't know the specific word. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look through some, well, we're going to look through some roots and understand them looking at examples of words that they appear in. So let's, let's get right into that, starting with... P-S-Y-C-H. Now, there actually was a TV show called Psych. And if you know what P-S-Y-C-H means, then it would have made perfect sense. This is a guy who, it's a comedy show, but also a detective show, would solve murders because he was very logical, but he would pretend to be psychic or have some special ability um, uh, with his mind to sort of uh, communicate with ghosts or something in the beyond. Actually, he was pretending that he really would just solve these crimes uh, through deduction and logic and finding clues, the sort of traditional way. That show is called Psych. When you see Psych, it somehow relates to the mind, study of the mind, behavior. Generally, we think of the brain or the mind. So psychology is the study of the mind specifically in behavior. A psychopath is a person suffering from a chronic mental disorder with abnormal or violent social behavior, right? Now, with that word, you hear people shorten it to psycho. There's a movie called Psycho about a crazy guy who's, well, I don't want to spoil it, but there may or may not be a skeleton living in his house who may or may not be his mother and he may or may not be a serial murderer. Anyway, people refer to crazy people as psychos, short for psychopath. Now, often people will call people psychopaths or psychos even when they aren't. But regardless, it's about someone who's crazy or got something wrong with their brain. Psychedelic, relating to or denoting drugs that pre uh, produce hallucinations, 
and apparent expansion of consciousness. So again, drugs you take in your mind to see visions and things like that, hallucinations, everything related to the mind. And generally, while we often associate the mind with the brain, the study of the brain would probably be using the, the word neuro, and the mind would be psych. So for example, Carl Jung or Sigmund Freud, they were psychologists, not neurologists. So psychologists would be, they don't really care, you know, what the pink goo looks like. They want to talk to you and understand your dreams and dive deep into, you know, your childhood trauma and things like that. Whereas a neurologist wants to touch the goo, wants to, uh, you know, put a scanner on your head, wants to pull out pieces and mm, see what it tastes like. They're actually more interested in the physical brain, right? So that's the difference between psych, psych and neuro. Neuro is related to the nerves, although the, the line, I suppose, could sometimes be blurred depending on what we're talking about. We talked about cardio already, so we'll just quickly fly through this one. Cardiology would be the study of and treatment of heart disorders. Cardiogram, a, a record of muscle activity within the heart, right? So an electrocardiogram is where they put that thing on your chest and they read the, the lines and say, hey, ooh, this is not good. Cardiovascular relating to the health of your heart and blood vessels. So if you do cardiovascular activity, then you're doing some sort of stuff that gets you breathing that is generally considered to be good to keep your heart strong. Often, though, people will shorten this to cardio, and they'll say something like, I'm going to the gym to do cardio. So they're going to the gym to maybe run or do the rope things, which is very fast, or, you know, do some jumping jacks or get on the bicycle and, and pedal, not lift weights, because lifting weights, very heavy weights, isn't considered to be cardio. That's considered to be strength training. Okay, not sailor, ship. We often associate it with adventure, right? Going out there, originally related to the sea. But an astronaut is a person who's trained to travel in a spacecraft, the sea of space, right? So uh, we associate that with, with the, the astro part with space or stars out there in the universe, or I don't even want to say stars technically because we kind of just lump everything together, whether it's a galaxy or a pulsar or a nebula. We kind of just say all the lights up there, <laughs> right? An astronaut would be someone who goes up there, right, uh, out into space, and they're like a person on a ship going out on a boat, right? Uh, nautical, relating to sailors or navigation. Uh, 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 nautical, maybe something you would see often in books like Moby Dick, right? Those sorts of those sorts of no uh, novels. You still see it sometimes, but it's probably less common than it used to be. And Argonaut in Greek mythology is a sailor of the Argo. Uh, and, and this is where the sort of connotation with adventure comes in. I mentioned that when we think of it, we think of often adventure, right? So it's not just a person who works on a boat. We often associate it with a, a person going out there doing something risky, scary, crazy that uh, uh, we, we might not do, right? An adventurer. Well, the story of Jason and the Argonauts is this story of a young hero named Jason who's, uh, who has divine lineage but is a person, is a human being, who is tasked with retrieving the golden fleece from a tree on, I believe, an island. And he has to go through many trials and struggles. He travels with many heroes. I believe Hercules is, or Heracles, is with him for a time and some other uh, well-known heroes and demigods travel with him as well. It's a very important mythical story in Greek mythology and ties together a lot of other, a lot of other stories. And uh, so when we think of that knot, the Argonauts are these people traveling with Jason in his quest for the golden, his quest for the golden fleece. So, um, 
yeah, we have that that connotation when we when we sometimes hear a word that contains not, not always. Neo means new. And uh, I don't know if that has a connection to the main character of the Matrix. I'm assuming so, but it was never explained to be to me exactly why, except maybe new Neo awakens and in outside of the Matrix, and then uh, I don't know. I don't know why he's called Neo. I, I don't know why he's called Neo. Actually, that's a good question. Um, so anytime you hear the word Neo something. Um, it's often related to uh, to art or things like that. It means an, a new version of that, right? Or there was a previous version and an updated version will be a neo that. So maybe you'll hear the word uh, neoclassical. Well, it's like classical, but it's somehow modernized or changed or augmented in some way. And so it's not exactly classical, but it's not completely not classical, right? So anytime you hear that, just think of, oh, it's kind of like an update, right? Often. A neologism is a newly coined word. So if I were to make a word up like clarple, clarple probably isn't a word. So I just made it up. And a clarple is the feeling of panic that you have when you're trying to think of a new word. So that's a neologism. A neologism is when you make up a new term or a word like clarpal, which is a terrible, honestly, a terrible feeling. I, I hope you never have to go through clarpal. Neonatal, relating to newborn children. Uh, neophyte is a person who is new to a subject, skill, or belief. This is a pretty uncommon word, neophyte, but you'll hear it in, a, for example, esoteric writings when you have well, a neophyte or an adept or someone who's just entered uh, uh, this, I don't know, new community or this, sorry, ancient community as a new member, possibly, and wants to learn the uh, deep secrets of the order or the uh, uh, maybe find out from the old masters what's really going on here, right? They're initiated. The neophyte is initiated by the masters of the uh, esoteric group, for example. Ortho, and we're just picking some out here. I mean, we could go through a billion of these. There are so many roots. We'll look at, we'll look at some more in a second just to give you a sense, but you know, I just want to get this across that there's some interesting root words, and once you get a feel for them, you, you can start picking out others, right? Uh, ortho means straight or correct, orthodontics, the treatment of irregularities in the teeth, people who have don't, don't have straight teeth and want to straighten them out. Orthodox, conforming to what is generally or traditionally accepted as right or true. This is often associated with religion. So, for example, you might have Orthodox uh, Judaism and you might have Reform Judaism. Well, those are two very different things. Orthodox is generally sticking with tradition and Reform Judaism is very different. Maybe people, uh, they barely follow it except for some, some maybe traditions. Uh, maybe they, maybe they observe certain holidays and things like that, but uh, they aren't as traditional. They don't care as much about the core beliefs that have been carried down from generation to generation. Well, this general way of being could be Orthodox, and it's used much more broadly than religion too. You'll hear, for example, in fighting, there's there's something called an orthodox stance. The way that you would stand would be kind of the traditional fighting stance. Well, that's called orthodox. Or I know my methods are somewhat orthodox. That means I know that I'm not always innovating new methods. I know I know I'm not always trying to come up with something new. But what I know is what has been tested by time, and this is what I'm teaching you. Yes, I know it's orthodox, but this is the way it's always been done, and if you learn it this way, you can you know, master the fundamentals, for example. So it's used pretty broadly. Uh, ortho orthography, excuse me, is the conventional spelling system of a language. Not very common. Again, it's just an example of a word, but 
anytime you see that word, orthopedics as well, this sort of thing is going to be uh, keeping things in order, keeping things straight, or sticking to tradition, how things have been. Pater, P-A-T-R or P-A-T-E-R, is connected to a father. Now, f the word father, I believe, is derived from the word pater. I think it's a derivative of the original root potter, which is either Latin or goes back further. But don't quote me on that. I don't know every origin of every root word. So patriarchy is a word that you hear a lot these days, which would be the you know, the social system that is kind of dominated by men and that uh, everyone else has to figure out the rules and hopefully get ahead in this, this system that's kind of controlled by men. So you're in the patriarchy. Often it's being critical of the patriarchy. Paternal, this is usually a positive word. So patriarchy is often referred to in a negative way, but paternal is often referred to in a positive way. So paternal care would be the, you know, the love, affection, teaching, whatever you get from your father. Often, the word paternal as an adjective is associated with that sort of fatherly, fatherly love. Uh, but sometimes you hear the word paternity, and paternity could be more like a, a genetic test. A paternity test would be to figure out who is the father of this baby. And patronage is support given by a patron, which you can kind of imagine in, in a way as a patron of somebody, an artist, for example, you contribute to an artist to support them. You are kind of fathering their creativity or, you know, you're Leonardo da Vinci and I'm your patron. I'm not, I'm not your real father, but financially, kind of, I am fathering your work with you creatively because I'm providing the money for you to live and you're doing the thing, right? So you can kind of get, <laughs> at least get a feeling for it. If you hear the word phobia, it's related to fear. So phobic, fear-related, philic is attracted to it. You like that. You, so if you're, something, if you're something philic, it's the opposite, right? If, it's, if you're hydrophilic, that means it loves water. And if it's hydrophobic, that means it repels water pushes water away. One is sucking in water and one is pushing water out. So arachnophobia is an extreme or irrational fear of spiders. I would argue that, I don't know, is there any irrational fear of spiders? Spiders look scary and many of them can bite and hurt people. So I don't know. Claustrophobia, fear of being enclosed in a small space or room. That feeling, maybe people who fear being buried alive, that kind of thing. Uh, so many different phobias. There's one called, uh, there, what is the one with the holes? That's called, uh, not propophobia, propophobia, something phobia. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm blanking on that specific, that specific phobia, but there's one that is a fear of holes. <laughs> Many little holes all together uh, is, is a phobia. And I used to have it, but then I did exposure therapy and I looked at a bunch of that sort of scary thing, and I got over it. So much over it that I forget the name of the phobia. <laughs> Xenophobia, dislike or prejudice against people from other countries or other cultures. So someone who says, I don't like this group of people. Well, that is xenophobia. It doesn't mean that you fear only, but also it could be dislike. Sof is related to wisdom. Wisdom, So in a lot of philosophy, you'll hear the name Sophia. So the, the name Sophia, the woman's name Sophia, is associated with wisdom as well. There's an ancient book, for example, called the Pistis Sophia. And this is actually a female character in the book. The Pistis part means faith or belief, and then the Sophia part means wisdom. So it's associated with, with wisdom. And the character Sophia in certain belief systems is always related to wisdom. Uh, so Sophia would be maybe the, an inspiration to certain types of philosophers. 
And philosophy, this word, the Sophie part of philosophy is the study of, the study or love of wisdom. That is actually what philosophy means, the love of wisdom, philosophy. Sophisticated, having revealing or proceeding from a great deal of worldly experience and knowledge. So somebody is sophisticated, they have gathered a lot of stuff and they have a certain taste, you have a very sophisticated taste or a sophisticated understanding. It, we often think of it as kind of complex, right, or detailed, but it's more than that. Because of the experience, because of wisdom, you have a complex understanding of something. A sophomore is a second year university or high school student. So this may be someone who doesn't have much wisdom yet. I think it's being used that way because often when we think of the word sophomore, we think of somebody who's not yet wise or still working toward gaining wisdom, right? So pretty, pretty common. And then finally, we have tele or distance. And obviously, we use this a lot in uh, modern day English for a lot of different things, right? You hear telecommunications, you know, basically communicating with people or communicating between things at a distance, right? Telephone, a system for transmitting voices, telescope, an optical instrument designed to make distant objects appear nearer, telepathy, the supposed communication of thoughts or ideas by means other than the known senses. So we can communicate from mind to mind. What am I thinking? Uh, did you get it? Did you get it? I hope so, because uh, I'm telepathic. I can communicate that. But if you didn't get it, that means you're not telepathic, and therefore it's not my problem. But I am, and so it's not my problem. Um, so that's it. So those are some common roots. And again, they're everywhere online. So I encourage you to go to a website like Reading Rockets and just, you know, look at these roots and their, their origins of these. So, so Amba, Aqua, Bene, Scent, uh, Circum, and they, you know, they give you some example words and definitions. Form, Fort, Fact, Jack, Judd, Mal, Bad, Malevolent, Malefactor. So you can at least get started here. And this, this particular one has both Greek and Latin roots and a list of prefixes and suffixes. Now you might say, well, what's the difference between prefixes, suffixes, and roots? I would say don't worry too much about it. Often suffixes are quite clear because they're telling you the form of the word, right? Uh, so that can be useful to know if it's a noun or an adjective form. You can look at the suffix or the end of the word, but the beginning often is about the meaning, right? And so whether it's a prefix or root is not super important. I sometimes get confused if something is a prefix or a root, and I don't really worry about it because I often, I often don't know. The important thing is that I know what it means, the prefix or the root, and that helps me guess words that I don't already know can be very, very useful. So if you have any questions about roots, if you have any questions about how to explore this, how to take this to the next step, let me know in the comments. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and also get a free course in the links in the description. All right. Okay, Alejandro is here. Hello, hey Alejandro. Your audio volume is a little low. I don't know if there's too much I can do about that. You have to turn it up a little bit. Um, I hear it okay. I hear my volume all right. I'm turning up the, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Let's try this, I'm on 93. Let me put it on 100. All right. Um, I have two elder brothers from my paternal side. Yep, that's a good example. Hisham, one package did. You stop adding your courses to Skillshare. You know, I haven't added a course to Skillshare um, in a while. I haven't, um, but I will be adding more in the future. Um, I could talk about that for a while, but I suppose the short and simple thing to say would be that some things happened at Skillshare 
that made me less enthusiastic about sharing uh, courses on Skillshare. And so um, one thing to do would be to, uh, I don't know, let Skillshare know that you're looking for certain courses. Um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get new courses up there. Don't worry. It's just not, it hasn't been a big priority, honestly, um, because of some stuff that happened. I'm facing difficulties pronouncing the word obvious. Could you please kindly tell me how, uh, how to say it correctly? Uh, can I just check? Is my sound okay, everybody? Can you check my sound? Is it too quiet? Is it, uh, is it all right? Uh, I hope so. I'm, I'm using a uh, slightly different sound system than I typically use, so I want to make sure that it sounds okay. Um, so the word is pronounced in three syllables, and it's made up of well, let me just let me just break it into parts for you. We're talking about this word. I'll just put it up on screen here. Actually, you know what? Let me let me do this. Let me go over here and put it up here like this and make it a little bigger. All right. Okay. This is from Abdul Malik. Ob, V, us. Now, I guess we could say is, but it's the way that people say it quickly is more like us. So, ob, V, like the letter V, us, us. Now, the tricky part is putting it all together because all of the sounds are voiced. So we don't say obvious. That's one common mistake, actually, with that word is to go obvious. That's incorrect. What you have to do is go straight from the b sound to the v sound without breaking your voice. The voice has to continue. Ob, ob, so it's got to go straight from the b to the v. B, 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 like that. B, 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 b. So you got to practice that. Ab, ab. Again, the mistake would be to go abavi and go and make a ba sound. That would be a mistake. Don't do that. Ab, 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 and then ab, v, and that's just the letter v, and then us, v, us, v, us, and you really are adding a little y sound in the middle of those two syllables, the v and then the yus, like y u s, right? So putting it together slowly. Obvious, 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 obvious. Uh, thanks, Hisham. I appreciate that. Yes, um, I will keep making courses. In fact, I've got t two coming out this month. Believe it or not, I'm 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 doing an experiment, and this one will go up on Skillshare, where I'm making my first. Uh, focused mini course, which I'm excited about. I uh, hope that helps. Abdul Malik, I hope that helps. Yeah, that's a tough one. Again, that issue I think is between the B and the V is, is the most common, uh, the most common issue there. I need to work on my lighting situation for sure. Cause it's dark. It's now dark outside, but I've got a light on the shadows are a bit strong. I'm not too crazy about the shadows. Guys, does the sound sound okay is my question. I got one comment that we were a little low. Sound is a little low, and I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned. I'm worried. I'm terrified. I'm beside myself. Yeah, I don't love the shadows. I don't love it. I have to go back to the studio, maybe. We have everything set up. I have my beautiful spaceship living room. I miss it. I miss my spaceship living room. It's so comfortable. All right. Okay, the sound is good. Okay. 
I just saw one comment that said it's. Uh, I think uh, Alejandro said my sound was a little low. To which I say, oh no. All right. All right. Let's do a Mad Lib. Let's do a Mad Lib, shall we? All right. If you've never heard of a Mad Lib, what, are you living under a rock? Well, they've been around for a while. And they're popular kind of fun word games. And they've kind of just become a thing that people do sometimes. People sometimes do it as a, as a party game. Sometimes they do it in schools to teach kids. What it is, is a silly story with blanks in it. And the blanks you have to fill in with words. And sometimes that's a noun or an adjective. It might be a plural or a singular noun. It might be an adjective related to the body or something like that. It's called a, it's called a Mad Lib. And we can make one. We can make a Mad Lib using ChatGPT. And all we have to do is ask in the right way using a prompt. So here's how we do it. Let's do an improv Mad Lib where you just ask me for words without any context clues. And then you'll fill in the blanks at the end to make a silly story. Ask me these one at a time in a back and forth way. Then ChatGPT says, sounds fun. Let's start. Could you give me a plural noun? So, so we just then, we go through this process where we, we, we provide um, answers to these simple questions. You do it one at a time. You don't know what it's going to look like in the end. And then you fill in all of the uh, blanks and it makes a haha, usually crazy story. So what would be a good plural noun? Let's go with... Um, Let's go with donkeys. Hey, what's going on here? Why can't I? Yes, hello, can I type? Oh, here, duh. <laughs> donkeys, what's wrong with me? Donkeys, all right, great choice. Now, how about an adjective? An adjective, um, an adjective, let's go with Let's make, let's keep it simple for now and let's get silly later. Hungry. Okay, perfect. Next, can you give me a type of liquid? How about bean juice? I don't even know if bean juice is a thing, but I want to use bean juice. All right, interesting choice. Now I need a past tense verb. Um, let's see, hovered, hovered. Let's go with, let's go with hovered. Yes, past tense verb. Okay, next, give me a noun. Let's see, let's try something interesting here. Let's try a non-physical noun. Let's go with a, um, a, hmm, sneeze, a sneeze. Yes, I like that. Because you can, you can make a sneeze a verb, but it can be a noun too. Nice one. Could you now give me an adverb? Fast. All right. Ah, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Um, down. Okay. All right. How about another adjective? Uh, let's see. Loaded. That could be having a lot of money or it could be very drunk. <laughs> interesting now give me a type of food a type of food uh let's see let's go with uh let's go with expired expired cheese <laughs> expired cheese 
Yummy. Now I need a verb. Let's see, a verb, a verb. Uh, let's keep the verbs pretty simple. Let's go with stare. Stare. Um, no, that could end up being weird. Yeah, all right, let's go with stare. All right, got it. Give me another plural noun. Oh, let's go with humps. <laughs> humps. We like humps. Okay. Great, now I need a number. Okay, um, let's see. 3,824.5. Okay. Very specific. I like it. Lastly, could you give me a part of the body? Let's see. Um, let's use, let's see, the part of the body. Um, how about left eyeball? Left eyeball. Not eye, eyeball. All right, here's the story. <laughs> so now, now, now we put it all together in a story that's hopefully, hopefully funny, but often not. I mean, sometimes it's just weird and doesn't make sense. In the heart of a distant valley lived a group of donkeys who were known for their unusually hungry appetite. One day, after drinking too much bean juice, this actually so far makes perfect sense, they found themselves hovering not above the ground, but a sneeze, they're hovering above a sneeze. Oh, now I'm picturing a sort of somebody <laughs> sneezed and then the cloud from the sneeze is floating above the ground and they're floating above that. Not hovering above the ground, but a sneeze that had been left down by a passing cloud. All right, that does not make sense. This sneeze was not just any sneeze. It was loaded with magic. <laughs> Determined to find more of this enchanted sneeze, <laughs> the donkeys set off on a quest. Their journey was long and filled with challenges, including a river of expired cheese that they had to stare at to make uh, to make it solid enough to cross, okay? <laughs> Staring at expired cheese so that it's solid enough to cross. I guess that works, yeah, okay. And a mountain made entirely of humps, <laughs> which they climbed with great difficult difficulty. After 3,824.1 miles, they reached the peak of the mountain, where they found a giant left eyeball staring back at them. It spoke in riddles, promising to grant them endless bean juice, but only if they could learn to hover without being so hungry all the time. The donkeys pondered this puzzle, realizing the journey had taught them that even a loaded sneeze could bring great adventures, and that sometimes staring into an eyeball could reveal the truth about expired cheese. And so... The donkeys returned home not just as heroes, but as wise creatures who knew the value of a good sneeze and the dangers of too much bean juice. That's not bad. That's not too bad. Okay, so try this out. Again, the prompt is, the prompt is here. You can ask it in a number of different ways. The idea is kind of to create a game. It gets, it's less interesting if you have to do all of them at once. Do the back and forth style, and you don't want to look at the blanks before. So you have to word the prompt kind of carefully to not to not see the whole story first, um, and then just answer the questions. Practicing your ability to come up with plural nouns and past tense verbs and interesting adjectives, right? You want to have a nice variety so that the story ends up being hopefully interesting. I think this one was actually not too bad. I like the idea of staring at expired cheese to make it solid enough to walk across. That is an image. That's a mental image right there. Anyway, try it out. Let me know how it goes. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and get a free course in the links in the description. Um, all right, expired cheese, anyone? Are, you, are your courses on Skillshare 
for a limited time or forever? Uh, well, uh, generally, I mean, the ones that are there are there. Um, they've been there for a long time. I, again, I haven't posted any courses there for a while. Um, maybe I can just kind of say what happened. But some time ago, they changed their rules and the change in rules that they made meant basically that overnight teachers on Skillshare with the courses there were making significantly less on Skillshare. Um, significantly. Like imagine if you woke up one morning, not that, I mean, they, they, they said it in advance, but just imagine your boss said, hey, um, starting tomorrow, we're going to, we've decided to pay you 70% less. <laughs> well, I, you know, things happen, but there's an, ins there's an incentive thing there where you think, eh, is it even, you know, is it worth it? I don't know. So, so when it comes to platforms, right, and there are, number one, there are rules, and number two, there are, you know, things that change, policy changes, and um, uh, I think that Udemy is a very good platform in general. I think that Udemy is very thoughtful about their teachers on Udemy who have courses there. And I think that they, um, they do their best to, to take care of them and offer them tools and things like that. Uh, I don't have that same confidence with Skillshare, unfortunately. I wish I did, but uh, I don't have that same confidence. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the future of Skillshare is, to be honest. I do plan to put a mini course there. Um, uh, but it's often not at the top of my priority list, just to be totally honest. Um, anyway, anyway, I hope that answers your question, Hisham. Um, all right. What else was I going to talk about? Uh, oh, yeah. Right. We're going to do word discovery and avoid using simple words. Uh, let's see. How was I going to do the simple words? All right. Let's do word. Let's do word discovery. I don't know if you guys can hear the crying, but my son is my son is crying. Can you guys hear that? In here, ah, ah, ah. he's not too happy right now about something. Something has happened. He's not too happy about it. Babies cry for unknown reasons. Okay, let's do the process. Sorry, guys. Hold on just one second. I'm pulling something up. I just want to make sure. Um, hello. Hello, AMR. Hello. Welcome. 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 Uh, let me switch over to here. Okay. Okay. All right, so there we go. The way that you learn words really matters. If you learn a word by simply translating it, the main problem is that you then have to carry two words around 
you have to carry the translation around, right? Both the word in your language, your your first language, your native language, and the English word. The second problem with this is that every word has a bunch of connotations. And so dictionaries or translators are often not great at catching those little feelings connected with a word. So if you if you say, hey, you, I'm going to learn this word, the word guideline, and I'm going to translate it into my language, and I'm going to say this word guideline equals that word in my language. The big problem with this is that while it may translate that way, there may be a bunch of little social connotations associated with the word guideline that don't translate. They don't get through the translation. And there may be a bunch of connotations that you have about the, the word in your language that aren't true for the word that you're learning in English, right? So you can see there's a problem. The answer to the problem is to do your best to build an English brain. And that means learning words in English. So I'm going to take you through a simple process for how to do that. We're going to just kind of go through it. I'm going to list it. We're going to start with a word and we're going to kind of just follow these, follow these steps. Now, the first thing I think, and we're just, let me, let me now just write this down for you. The first thing is to define number one, Learn and define. You have to know what it means. Now, you don't have to do that by translating it into your language. Let's, let's find a word, discover a word, and see what happens next, okay? So let's go over here. And all right, I'm scrolling in this article. Ha ha, la 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 la, this is very fun. I'm going to zoom in a little bit and I come across, I come across an interesting word. Perhaps, perhaps I come across, oh, what would be, what would be an interesting one? Ah, uh, maybe I'm in this and I see, ah, uh, outline important limitations and constraints that may derail timelines, budgets, and deliverables. Defining these parameters of a project, uh, helps alleviate unforeseen issues. So maybe, okay, there's a lot to learn here. There's some words I don't know, but let's say I want to start with parameters. Okay, so I want to know what this word means. Now, how can I figure that out if I'm not going to translate? Well, a simple way to do that would be to simply define it, to define the word in a dictionary. The problem with that can be that definitions are hard to read, definitions are hard to understand. I think that there are three tools that you can use when you're in the define learn stage. Number one would be uh, vocabulary.com. Number two would be the free dictionary. And number three would be an AI tool like ChatGPT. So let's see what we get from vocabulary.com. I'm just gonna go to, I'm gonna Google vocabulary. I'm going to go to vocabulary.com. I'm gonna put in the word parameters. I'm also going to go into, you'll see this in just a second. Uh, I'm also going to go into ChatGPT and I'm going to, I'm gonna make a prompt, okay? So let's, Let's hop over here now, and we'll start with this one. So parameter, we'll see if we can understand it just by the definition alone. A parameter is a limit in mathematics. A parameter is a constant in an equation, but parameter isn't just for math anymore. Now any system can have parameters that define its operation. You can set parameters for your class debate. Okay, 
So maybe I'm getting the idea, but it's still not totally clear to me, right? Um, so I think I have I think I have a sense, but what do I do next? Well, maybe I go over to ChatGPT, which is a little bit more interactive, and I say something like uh, define define and then parameters. Okay, and I see what I get with ChatGPT. We'll see if it's too complicated. In programming, parameters refer to variables. Okay, this is too long, so I'll hit, okay, this is stop. Okay, make, uh, make it simpler um, with all meanings. I'm typing with one hand. Uh, all with all meanings. All right, so we'll do that. All right, let's simplify. So the nice thing about using an AI tool like, like Google Gemini or ChatGPT or Claude would be that you can have a bit of a back and forth. So if you don't get much value from the definition in the dictionary, again, vocabulary or the free dictionary, you can get a feeling for it this way. Uh, in uh, Let's see, general use, a parameter is like setting uh, a setting that influences something or decides how something should be done. Think of it like adjusting the volume on your TV. The volume level is the parameter that controls how loud the sound is. In math, a parameter is a special kind of number that is used in equations to help describe a pattern or relationship between numbers. Okay. In science and research, parameters are factors that can be measured or controlled in an experiment uh, or study. Okay. In programming, okay, so parameters can be a detail, a setting, a value, or some piece of information that helps in defining or controlling something. All right, so maybe I have a good idea. Now, what's the next step in this process? The next step in this process is to explore the context, to explore, explore the context. So this is where, now that I understand the, hopefully, general meaning, now that I understand the general idea, I should look for more examples. And the, the way that I do this is either by finding more articles, asking ChatGPT to give me a bunch of examples that I can use, or perhaps using the other thing that I mentioned, the free dictionary. Now. The vocabulary.com is pretty good at this, but I think the free dictionary is better. So let's pop open the free dictionary and let's just go over there and see what we get when we put in parameters here. I think I should probably I should probably zoom in a little bit, hey? Okay. Okay, parameter. Parameter is a measurable characteristic, a constant factor, serving as a limit, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the basic parameters of our foreign policy. Okay, let's look at some more, some more examples. The examples, the nice thing is they label the examples in yellow. All the parameters of shelter, where, uh, where people live, what mode of housing they will choose, and how they will pay for it. Okay. Um, an experimental school that keeps expanding its expanding the parameters of its curriculum. Okay, all right. So these, I mean, I, there's some interesting examples there. Uh, a designer must work within the parameters of the budget. Okay, that's actually a good one. A designer must work within the parameters of budget and practicality. That one gives me a pretty good sense for how it's used. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you do something outside of what we want, then it's not useful and we're not willing to pay for that. You designers stay within what we want. There are a lot, there's a lot of flexibility there, but don't go, you know, we asked you to deliver a logo. <laughs> so, and the, and the logo has to have our brand colors. So if it's got lime green and it's not a logo, then it's not within the parameters. You have a lot of creativity and flexibility, but don't go outside of the walls. Okay, so all right. So I'm getting an idea from some examples, and I could go over here to, again, ChatGPT, and I could say, uh, let's see, um, give me, and again, I'm typing with one hand here, some 
some uh, realistic uh, uh, examples. This is me typing with one hand, okay? Give me some realistic examples. I'm in the same chat that I used to define it. So another nice thing about ChatGPT is you can kind of, you're poking the original thing. You're, 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 it's a little more mushy. Uh, the process is more human. It's like having a conversation with a pretty smart person who can come up with things. Okay, so let's see. This is not quite what, no. No, on your mobile phone, you, oh, okay. Level of brightness, uh, let's see. This is an explanation. That's not qu quite what I want, no. Let me, let me type with two hands and say very clearly what I want. This is the downside of using ChatGPT. You have to sometimes prompt and prompt again to get what you want. There's a back and forth. Okay, so what I want is, no, uh, please, please give me specific things that people might might say as examples using this word they should be realistic okay so let's see if we get some something maybe in quotations or something like that how people would use the word at work okay now i'm getting some specific examples so you know sometimes you have to just ask in a different way Oh, but ask nicely because the, the, the AIs, they will remember if you're not nice. We need to define the parameters of the project before we start, including the budget. All right, that's pretty good. Let's set some parameters for our vacation, like the maximum amount we're willing to spend and the types of activities you want, uh, we want to do. My nutritionist set specific parameters for my meal plan, including caloric intake, and micro, macronutrient ratios. For our essays, I'm giving you broad parameters, at least 1,000 words on a topic related to environmental science. So as long as it's related to environmental science and as long as it's more than 1,000 words, I am within the parameters. So we might say, I could, could I say, ah, well, as long as I stay within the parameters... I can do whatever I want. Maybe that's a good way. Maybe that's a good way to use it. We have quite a few, quite a few examples we could look at. And if the examples are too difficult, again, that's the back and forth nature of a tool like ChatGPT is you can poke it. You can say, can you make, make the examples simpler? And then you get simpler examples, right? So that's, that's the nice thing about it. Again, I think you can still use tools like the free dictionary and vocabulary.com. I think there's a place for that, but having the back and forth is good. You don't have to stick with one tool. Claude is actually getting pretty good. And Gemini is also Google. Google's um, LLM Gemini is actually pretty good as well. So where are we in our process? Well, we have first, we have we have learned the word. We've learned what it means without translating it. We have defined the word. We know, right? We know how it's explained. Some way that makes sense to us. I get it. Now I look at the context. I see it within examples. I see how it is used. I may go back to the original sentence where I found it and look at it and say, okay, now I, now I think I see what it means within this sentence. Okay. Okay. Now what I want to do is a third and very important step, which is to <laughs> remember it. <laughs> now, remember it. Now, this is obvious, but I think you don't want to, you want to choose your methods carefully. What does it mean to remember a word? Well, that means that I think when I'm talking, that word may just pop out of my mouth naturally. That's what really remembering a word means, in my opinion. I know what it means. I learned it in context. Now it pops out of my mouth sometimes when I'm speaking, naturally. That means that I've remembered it. 
I have to sit there and think about the word for an hour and a half, then, you know, I, I didn't do a very good job at point number three, right? There are different methods for remembering things. One is called spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is where you put it in a flashcard system like Anki, and it shows you the word or the definition, and you supply the word or a hint or something at a certain period of time repeated, and the space between the repetitions increases each time so that eventually you remember it immediately. If that works for you, fantastic. Another way is through a mnemonic system, like a memory palace. This is also good. I like this one. This is where you do all the hard work up front. With the flashcards, you have to do all the hard work in the repetitions over time. With the, with the memory system or a mnemonic like the memory palace, you do all the hard work at the beginning and lock it in. This is where a lot of creativity comes in. So I, I would prefer this one. I think both are fine. Some people like to just write the word down a hundred times. That's a type of repetition, right? Uh, so they're different. They're whatever works for you. The point here for number three is find the method that works for you. If you don't know all the methods, you should at least learn them to know which one works for you. So let's do an example of how would we put this into a memory palace. Let's say I have a memory palace that is my my high school that I went to. That means I know everything within the high school in my, and I can visit it in my mind. You're not there anymore, but you spent every day there for such a long period of time that it is a memory palace because it is locked, right? You can, you can literally walk around in it in your head. That's what makes it a memory palace. That's what makes it powerful. And it's big if it's a high school or something like that. So what you do is you have that memory palace dedicated to a certain thing. For example, new English vocabulary. So this is your English vocabulary memory palace. Maybe you have another one for remembering other things, the countries, names, and the dates that um, wars happened, or, you know, there are a lot of different ways to use memory palaces. So maybe you're using your high school, right? So maybe what you picture here is, well, let's see, a mnemonic related to the meaning of parameters. A mnemonic related to the meaning of parameters. So let's say that there is a, a field outside, and the field has markers, right? And maybe each, each mark is one meter. Often fields have meter, meter marker, markers, right? And what you picture is someone flying in and landing maybe within one small meter between one line and another from a parachute, right? So they parachute in and land between two meter markers, very precise. Maybe you could even picture the space between those two meter markers as painted purple or something, and the space in front and after are just grass. So it's a grass, it's a grassy field. There are meter markers on it to measure for, for lines on the field. And one of those, the whole piece is kind of purple. And this person comes in on a parachute and lands right in the purple area and doesn't go over. Difficult, right? So what have you remembered there? You remembered that you have to be in within the lines, right? You remembered that they're meter markers because it's one meter, one meter. And the person came in on a parachute. So para, meter, parameter, parameter. And what does it mean? It's somehow related to being within the rules or being within the lines. So there you go. And that's just one I came up with just now. You got to get creative and use what works for you. But I doubt now, if you didn't know the word parameter, I doubt that you're going to forget it now that you have that visual. So that's the power of the memory palace. So... We've got one, two, and three, and three is to remember it. Now, what do we, what should we do next? Well, four is pretty simple. Four is to, four is to start 
using it. To actually start using it. So, okay, I've learned it, I've seen it in context, I've remembered it, I've found a method for remembering it, but now it's to actually, when you're in a conversation, when you're explaining something, when you're writing an email, when you're doing anything, if you see a place where it fits naturally, don't force it, but if you see a place where it fits naturally, use it. So maybe as an example, I might say something like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm writing something and I say, um, in the workplace, tweaking the parameters of a project, such as uh, deadlines, goals, uh, team roles, can really influence creativity and innovation. So if you tweak or adjust or change the the things that affect the team, right? The deadline is that will have an effect. Maybe if we if it's next week or next month, our goals for the team, right? Who does what, and maybe the titles they have. If if these are things, these knobs are considered the parameters. If we tweak or adjust these parameters, then that's going to change the way people feel. It's going to change their how creative they can be. It's going to influence. Their, how much they can innovate, right? So I might make a sentence with that. I might make two, I might make three. That's a good way to remember. It's part of the memory part, but also a way of actually using it, a way of actually putting it into practice, very important. And then again, when you're out there in the world and you have a chance to use it, try to use it, see if it works, right? And then finally, number five, the last step. This is all the steps that you need to learn a word where you really learned the word and you can all you can actually use it and uh you're not translating okay number five is to this is kind of general but make then make connections so think of think of a Think of a word as being in a net or a mesh connected to other words. And the more connections it has, the easier it is to use in an automatic way. So when I use a word, the reason that I can just speak without thinking of words, why that's very easy for me is because every word I may use will have all of these connotations and associations. Right? Even if even a word as simple as car, think about all of the connections that I have with this word. Car, maybe uh, top gear, car, the parts of the car, the doors, crash, deer, I had a deer once, repair, transportation, isolation. If I don't have a car, I can't get anywhere because I live in the middle of nowhere, so I feel isolated. So uh, ch maybe childhood, not having a cool car, shame, embarrassment, uh, you know, all of these things, all of these thoughts and feelings and little things that are associated with this word help me just automatically think of it when I need it without really thinking. We don't often include this part when we learn words, right? But actually, this is part of really, really learning a word, is seeing it in 10 different situations and having memories of using it and having, you know, feelings about it, all of this stuff. And so there, what you do is, number one, if you want, you can do an exercise where you write down words that you think of when you think of that new word, parameter, for example, or, and or, you as you use it and as you hear it, you take mental note about how you used it and how it was being used when you heard it, right? And you, you try to remember the whole context. You try to remember how you were feeling. You try to remember why you, if you used it, why you decided to use it. This is not a very clear process. This is not a simple thing you can do. All I'm asking you to do here is do your best to allow this new word to connect to your life, to allow this word to 
build up its own connotations in your mind over time. Again, this is not something where it's an instruction of, here, do this, but just something to be aware of that it, it will happen. And if you're okay with it happening and you kind of encourage it to happen, then it's going to be easier and easier over time to recall that word and use it when you need it. So I know that's kind of vague and unclear and fuzzy, but that's what it is, right? So that's kind of the fifth part of the process of really learning a word. So we've gone through these five steps. Learn, explore, remember, use it, and then make connections. And if you do those things, you will, you will be the master of all of the words that you learn without having to translate. So good luck. Good luck as you do that. I encourage you to explore. Treat it as an exploration. Treat it as a process that's hopefully fun and interesting. If you have any questions, let me know. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and also get a free course in the links in the description. All right. Um, Isham says, I have bought that one course about prepositions on Udemy and I'm thinking of buying the one about culture. I have got to say they're getting better and better. Thank you for saying so. I'm glad you're enjoying the prepositions course. That course, which you're right, is not on Skillshare, although maybe I should, but it's just such a big course. It's 30 hours or something like that on just on prepositions. Such an important topic. It's kind of along the lines of what I was talking about of you need to you need deep exploration, deep connections to really have an intuition for words. And that's why that course is so long because there are so many examples <laughs> for every single preposition. Prepositions used to talk about actions, preposition used to talk about locations. And, you know, it's, it's a massive course. Um, and then the culture one uh, is, is, is only if you're interested in that kind of thing. And it's, it was for me, I felt like a, a really risky course to do because, um, how do you talk about a culture? It's such a pretentious thing to do, right? Um, but then I thought, well, yeah, but part of learning language is having the cultural background. And if I could shed some light on, on the culture I grew up in, at least, I might be able to give some insights that might help add context to language that you're learning, right? So I decided to do it. I try to do it with humility, knowing that my perspective on my own culture is limited. I grew up with the background that I had. I have the views that I have. I have the biases that I have, and I can't not have them. And someone who grew up over there or over there in the same culture would have a different perspective and make a different course. And so it's, it's a tough thing to do, but I, I did try my best, and I tried to make it interesting. And, and the purpose of that, again, is to to try to give a bigger context, not just here's words that you should learn, here's grammar, here's things that you should learn, but a little bit more of here's the slightly bigger view, and this is what the language fits into, kind of. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, pick it up. If that sort of thing sounds too, you know, not hardcore language e for you, I, I totally understand. No, it's definitely not, not for everybody, but it seems like people who do enjoy that sort of thing are enjoying the course, which is nice to see. Um, uh, yeah, I took a lot of, I, I spent a lot of time on, on all the courses, although uh, there's an exception. I've got a course coming out, which is a mini course, which is hyper-focused, and I wrote the course in one day and recorded the course in one day, and that's very rare for me. Usually it takes me weeks and weeks to write it and months and months to record it. I did a mini course that's coming out that's going to be probably only an hour and 20 minutes long that's hyper-focused on one thing. So I'm excited about that. That will be an experiment, and um, it will definitely be you know priced accordingly. It will be, um, I'll be probably the, the least expensive course for sure. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll call it a day. We've covered a lot of stuff. It's now 9 p.m. Tomorrow, I'm going to watch the eclipse. I'm going to go to see the eclipse. I'm very excited about it. I wish that I had purchased 
the filter for my telescope in time, but I did not, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, hopefully I'll at least be able to get a telescope photo, which I'll post on, if I can get it, I will post it on Instagram. Um, if you want, you can follow me on Instagram. It's luke.pretty. That's my Instagram. Um, I don't post any English-related stuff on Instagram. It's just personal photos and stuff. So uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram if you want to. I don't care. Uh, but I'll probably post pictures of the eclipse on Instagram. Um, all right, before my voice dies... Let's call it a day. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for being here. Again, if you haven't done so, be sure to like and subscribe. Get a free course in the links in the description. Great to have everybody here. Thank you for listening. If you've been listening and you want to watch, you can do that on YouTube and Facebook. If you're watching and you would like to listen, check out the links in the description. Join the Discord for free. Feel free to follow me on Instagram if you want to. Look out for another episode next Sunday, either here in my house or maybe in the studio, back in the spaceship. Perhaps, probably that. Yeah, I think so. I like the lighting situation better. But anyway, have a great one. If you're watching the eclipse, enjoy it, take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.